There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my StreamYard virtual studio with a guy by the name of Don Moxley. Don, what is up, my brother? How are you? Just loving life, man. Having a good day. Don is, along with his wife, traveling in a fifth wheel all across the country, visiting states, national parks, all sorts of amazing places to see. And maybe he'll even actually talk about a little bit of that in this podcast that we were talking about that off air. But let me give you guys his bio. For those of you who do not know him, uh, he is the Director of Applied Science at Longevity Labs and also the developer of HRV Plus from Mode and Method. And also Don has an illustrious background uh, for, I would say, like just the sports performance and the college side of things. I mean, I, I Don, actually, we don't know each other formally, but like I know of you and no, have known of you from a lot of different people. We all, we have a lot of similar friends and colleagues. Um, why don't we, why don't, you know, before we jump into, because we got a bunch of different points we're going to talk about today, but why don't you just talk a little bit about traveling across the country in a fifth wheel? <laughs> well, it's, it, what, now listen, this, it's, it is not, it is not a sacrifice. If you look over my right shoulder here, that's my sauna that I put in my fifth wheel. That's awesome. Um, so we've got a red light therapy panel in my office, you know, we, we, we've done it in a way that we're able to, so I've got a Peloton bike. I've got all my strength stuff. Sure. Um, and, uh, but you know, my, I taught, I work for a company called longevity labs. Sure. And you start talking about longevity and, and, um, I think of life in three thirds that you spend your first third learning yep. and then, and then you spend your second third earning in service to others, meaning yeah. that you're working, right. you're raising a family, you're doing things like that. But then you have what's called the third third. And, and my daughter, my wife and I have one daughter and she um, moved out of our home. We lived in central Ohio for, for 60 years. I, I grew up in Ohio. Um, and she moved out. I looked at my wife and I said, okay, we're done. I said, she, you know, she went, and got a job at North coaching at Northwestern and I said, you know, she's not coming back. I mean, we're done. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we always, we, we have always liked the mountains. And I said, I want to find a place where we can wake up in the morning and drink our coffee, looking at mountains. So awesome. we, we thought about Colorado and we spent, we spent a month and a half in Colorado last year, worked our way through Wyoming and Montana and all the way sure. across and, and back and forth across the country. We're now on our third trip back and forth um but we um we we're look we're look we're waiting for the universe to give us our next home um <laughs> and we're we're taking it in and we've we just spent six months in the pacific northwest uh oregon and washington we really like it there Beautiful. but you know my kid's now coaching at Pitt, so we decided to come back across so we could watch her work you know it's not you know you always get to get go to work and watch your kids work, right? Yeah, that's amazing, um, dude. And um, awesome. so, yeah, so that's that's our life, and we're probably so we're back in Pitts. We'll be in Pittsburgh for a couple months. Then I think we're going to go to New England. Um, and if we get New England in, we will have uh, forty five of the forty eight states in. Um, I think we'll be missing Kansas. Where, what will we be missing? We'll be missing Kansas and possibly like Tennessee, Kentucky, which I've been to. We just haven't stayed there in the rig, but of the lower 48, it's, it's been, a, it's been pretty cool. And that's awesome, man. And you, you know, we got all your biohacking tools built into the rig. I love that. So, so we, so we've got, like I said, red light, red light's a big deal. You know, oh, yeah. before, before we started recording, we were talking about light and heat and environments and so forth. Yeah. And, 
And I talk about my four big rocks of longevity and performance. Um, you know, if, if you, the, the um, seven habits of highly effective people, they talk about, there's a piece in there where they talk about putting rocks in the jar that, you know, you put the big rocks in, you got to get the gravel in around that and you get sand and water, but you got to get the big rocks in the jar first. And in biohacking, there can be a lot of sand and gravel. Um, and if you fill your jar with sand and gravel before you get your big rocks in, you don't get the critical stuff. And, and my four big rocks are movement that you hack with exercise, sure. uh, nutrient dense food that you hack with supplements, sleep. You don't, you don't hack sleep. You hack the sleep environment. Um, but, um, and then finally light, I think light is, light is as important a rock in the longevity and performance jar is anything. So, um, I started looking at light, you know, when I was a sports scientist at Ohio state 15 through 18, we had a, we were working with the air force research lab out of Wright Patterson air force base. And they brought us this thing called a Nova Thor table, which is this huge red $160,000 red light table. And we, and one of my, one of my national champions, um, tore uh an acl wrestling in the olympic trials this would have been 17 um torn acl and so we're trying to get this kid back for his senior year and i walk him into this this red light table and he goes in on crutches i put him in there for 20 minutes i take him out and he walks out with his crutches on his shoulder and i'm like whoa what what is going on here yeah. and that's what got me looking at the quality of light so I've invested in it a couple of times. I've got, I've got good friends down in Florida. They're over in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, they've got a company called Therasage that I really like. Um, they do red light panels. I've got a red light panel hanging in here behind me. Um, but getting that, getting, you know what, Jay? We don't die when we run out of time. We die when we run out of energy. Energy is what keeps us going. And when you start to look at the ability of light to cross the skin, to get into the cell, to, to invigorate the mitochondria, it's, it's, you have to pay attention to this. Now, yeah. I don't, I don't think we have a handle on things like light therapy, cold therapy. I don't think we have a handle like we do exercise and sauna, um, yeah. exercise and sauna, we can prescribe very effectively. Um, and, 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 but you know, these other things are emerging. We're starting to understand them, but I think light is a critical tool. Well, I'm a huge proponent of red light therapy. I mean, we just wrote a 9,000 word article on it. Uh, I use the profecta, the trifecta pro 450 bed, you know, which is a $75,000 red light device every single day. Yeah. So is my wife. So is my daughter who's, uh, 15, about to turn 16 who's in performance cheer. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you know, the photonic quality of ear infrared light and red light at specific wavelengths. The problem is, Don, is that unfortunately, and I, again, I wrote about this and I also did a podcast when I interviewed really the father of red light, Dr. Carl Rothschild, you know, who's been the guy who's done all the research in the last 25 years. And of course, it's his company that I am uh, uh, promoting now, uh, Trifecta. But um, you're right, what you said. I mean, we don't understand it at the level that we understand other modalities and other things. And again, it's really just experiential. You, like, you can talk to 10 different people that manufacture red light technology devices, and they'll all give you 10 different answers on like, what is the right therapeutic dosage? Now, we do know that from an infrared light standpoint or near infrared light standpoint, that's the, those are the quality or the wavelengths yes. and the frequency that will heal, right? So for people that have autoimmune diseases, uh, and obviously other forms of uh, decay, uh, advanced tissue re degeneration and stuff like that, even uh, neuro de neurodegenerative disorders, the, it's the near infrared light where it's the red light frequency and wavelength that uh, you know ultimately improves cellular health, cr it creates fat loss, uh, enhances mitosis. It does you know all these different things, obviously optimizes mitochondria. You were just talking about that, but um, I'm a huge, huge proponent of red light. In fact, all my friends that have uh, resources, I tell them you need to put a really high power, what I call high powered medical grade red light uh, product in your home. And obviously, you know, without getting into a com competition thing of some of them, there's, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, companies out there now that are all. Problem is, though, is that, you know, five to seven years ago, and again, I won't name names, but I could, 
uh, a lot of the red light companies were putting out products that were not, let's just put it at the level necessary to really, truly bathe your cells in the light that is necessary to actually provide all these different effects and, and benefits. And again, you know, I know you probably know Ari, you know, his book, I've got most of the red light books. Uh, this is the newest one, Carl's uh, Illuminated Healing. And it's mm-hmm. an amazing book. It has a lot of research. One of the things I didn't know about red light, Don, was uh, it also enhances um, the microbiome's ability to upregulate uh, Acromantia mucillus, which, as you know, if you can you know, cleanse the microbiome and improve the strength of the microbiome, you're going to be pretty strongly protected, if not impervious. Absolutely. Many of the diseases, right? Because almost all disease ideology originates in the gut. Yep. And a lot of people don't know that. Yep. But I'm down. I'm down. That's awesome that you, and I like your four points. And by the way, you literally said Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective per- people. You, do you realize that probably the average person under the age of 25 doesn't even know who Stephen Covey is? Doesn't know what the seven habits of highly effective people. True story. I met Stephen uh, when I worked for Kelly Blue Book before I became whatever I am now, <laughs> online gypsy. Uh, and, and he is an amazing human being. Like, yeah, absolutely. Literally- Arguably one of the best books ever written. I mean, if you're in business, you should read this book. If you but to meet him in person, man, that dude was wow. I mean, I met him in 2000. It was either 2005 or 2004. And he died literally like eight or nine years later. But like he was still in his 60s, a very powerful speaker. Yeah. Like he had an aura and a presence about him. But that's so cool that you brought that up because I was like, he just said the seven habits of highly effective people. <laughs> If, if I'm anything, I'm a pretty ferocious uh, consumer of of written material. I, but I've now shifted over to listening more than reading directly. But um, but I and and as if if you it's if you can just take one little thing. Listen, I love Seven Habits. There's there's eight things in that book that can drive you. His next book, The Eighth Habit, is also yeah. is very good. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's it's one of those. It's a guide. It's a success guide. Yeah. Um, when it comes yeah. right down to it, it comes, I mean, what, what you just said, I love that but reading, I mean the whole thirds thing, but reading is essential because reading creates awareness mm-hmm. and then the awareness is usually coming from ex- your experiential body of work. Right. Well, so whatever it is you do, whatever it is your trade, I mean, even it's like traveling, right? Like traveling around the world, experiencing different people, different cultures, different, uh, uh, languages, you know, s- spiritual uh, beliefs and inclinations, all that stuff creates awareness. And, and it's like, you know, before we jump into your topics, the saddest part of today, Don, and I know you know this um, because you've worked in the education realm, kids don't read. And it's insane yeah. how bad it's gotten that even the schools are not even asking children uh, depending on where you're at, you know, and I know there's private schools out there and homeschooling and all this stuff, but like the curriculum has degenerated to a point where they don't even read the classic literature pieces anymore. It's unreal, really. Yeah, it's a challenge. And and listen, I, I don't I don't depend on the schools to raise my kid. <laughs> That's for sure. That was that was on my wife and I. And luckily, I married to an educator um, who was who was very good at what she did. Um, and our daughter benefited from that. She grew up at a house with two teachers. Um, and, and she's a pretty sharp kid now, but that that's all part of it. And she's a pretty, but I don't depend on the school for that. Now I tell you, we made a decision when she was born that we changed, we moved, we used to live in downtown Columbus, a little, little part of Columbus called German village, which was a great place to live when you're single, when you're, when you're single or married, young married couple. Um, restaurants are good. The nightclubs, I mean, just the whole downtown life. But as soon as our daughter was born, I said, nah, I'm not raising a kid here. And I don't, I'm not sending a kid to uh, inner city schools. And luckily I had the resources that I was able to sell a house and move into another very good community and raise my kid in a community that supported yeah. our beliefs and, and, yeah. and those, I think, I mean, she's a very good writer. She's a, you know, the Granville schools did a very good job of that. Um, so you know, that's that, those are parenting decisions that you have to make along the way. And, and Jay, you know, not to go too far off topic, part of the challenge is, is that people treat their kids like furniture. It's yeah, like, no it's an addition to their household. And that, that, that's, that, that's the wrong attitude. 
Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. the, I, I, I have a, res- I feel I have a huge responsibility the same way my parents provided me. Now, listen, I grew up in a small country school, but I had two parents that taught us that we were limitless. Yeah. Um, we can do anything we want to do. And, and that's a, that's a, that's something I wanted my kid to learn. Um, so, you know, it's that, it's that responsibility. Listen, we made them, we're going to raise them. You got a responsibility there. A hundred percent. I, I, we, we, I, I, I couldn't, I, I, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, I don't know how I could even disagree with any of that. I mean, it's definitely the parent's responsibility to make sure that your children are educated outside of school. Um, it, it just, I don't know. It just, it's mind blowing to see the difference in just 20 years in the school system, as far as the curriculum and the way things go and stuff like that. Now, it seems like they really just overburden them with like busy stuff and that the kids really are not getting, you know, the, what I would call the experiential body of, of work that you and I got. Cause again, and, and again, things are different, right? Because when you and I grew up, we didn't have technology. So if you were correct and we didn't have, we had very little standardized testing. Yes. Um, and, and I think, and now listen, we can do another entire podcast on this, but, um, but it's, it's the, the role of standardized testing. My wife, my wife was a science teacher, social studies and science teacher. And one of the things that just frustrated her to no end that by the time they took the standardized test for science, that was the eighth standardized test those kids t- had taken in yeah. the last month of school. Yeah. She said, yeah, she realized they were checked out, you know, they were done. Um, and then the school wanted to base her pay on the performance of the, these kids sh- tests. And, and it just, the, the, we're in a situation where technology's changed everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Our kid, you know, I watch my kid walk through life. You know, my kid's one of those kids that grew up, you know, she, she had a cell phone relatively early. We were very, we paid a lot of attention to it. And the re- one of the big reasons we did is, is Jacqueline was a very good athlete. She was on travel teams. We were all yeah. over the country with both hockey and lacrosse. And social is how she connected to all these kids. And now she has these incredibly vigorous uh, relationships with all these little kids, with these kids that she co- that she played and coached with all these years. And it's beautiful to watch. That's and awesome. The other thing that happened, she came to me for help with a math problem one night. And I looked at it and I'm like, Jacqueline, I, I don't know how to solve this. Um, well, she, she whips out her phone. She takes a picture of the question. She's asking me, she texts it to a friend of hers. Her friend sends back, here's the way it works. And I'm watching this whole thing. I'm like, oh my God, this is so powerful. Insane. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, you know, she, I don't, I don't think she's a tick, you know, she has TikTok and Insta and those things like that, but I don't think she's, she's, I don't think she's hooked on it. I don't think and she doesn't define herself by, by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you've got to pay attention to it. There's no, you have to, I mean, that's well, just the time we live in. It's, it, it's interesting. We, and, I, and I appreciate that we're going this way and that it's not just the talking points because this is a good free flowing conversation, but it's interesting because there is a, there's great benefit as you just demonstrated in technology. But you have to use technology creatively and not consumptively. And that's the issue is that most people consume, 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 right? They go from Netflix to the internet, to video games, to porn, whatever it is. It's again, it's just this constant consumption that they're not creating. But if you use this amazing technology, like your daughter and her friend did to create and to you know, think and, and, and learn, build think, yeah. exactly. And to build, then it becomes an amazing conduit. And obviously it's an asset, but again, it, it comes back to what you originally said. Like we, as parents have to limit the usage and obviously instruct the judicious usage of the technology. And you're right, bro. I mean, like how many people literally just look at their kids as a part of, you know, an addition to their house? It's, well, I'll tell you, I have you ever, um, there's a great author out there just to throw another book in the mix. That's sure. what I do. It's called the coddling of the American mind. The, the author is Jonathan Haidt. Um, one of the other books he wrote that I love is called the righteous mind. Why good people disagree about politics and religion Two two great books. Um, but the coddling of the American mind that sh- it talks about 
what's going on in education, in schools. You know, the, we're starting to see some pushback. There's certainly a pendulum that runs with this. But um, if you're raising a kid and you're trying to understand technology and the difference between, you know, listen, I turned 62 on my next birthday. I got all the way through my undergraduate without, without computers, without yeah. using a personal computer. Yeah. I used my first personal computer in grad school and shortly thereafter. So we're similar. Um, I, I, my senior year, I'm 10 years younger than you. Oh, no, really nine. But I, the same thing, like my senior year of college, a oh, uh, green screen word presser, processor came out. I was, yeah. It was, and it, listen, now c look at us, okay? We're sitting here communicating across this technology, which it's beautiful the, the way it's worked, it's way, the way it's worked out when it's used correctly. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, but it certainly has changed the game. It, it has. And, and we all have to adapt. I mean, it's crazy because like, no matter where you go, my wife and I were, we were people watchers, obviously, but the other day we were, I forget where we were, but it was like a place that had mostly seniors and, you know, boomers and oh, you're, you're not a boomer yet, bro. <laughs> you're still Gen X, but like the reality, I'm the, I'm the last year of the boomer. I'm, well, I'm the, last the, the last year. Okay, cool. Okay. But th these were people in their seventies and up and, um, they were all on screens. Yeah. Like now, that literally every single one of them was like this. Yeah, and my wife and I just looked at each other and say it, it is contaminated. So all of society. I mean, everyone is addicted to quote unquote to the dopamine fix. Yeah, I think. Listen, I don't want to condemn. I don't. I you know. I don't want to be that. You know that 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 person. But um, it can be very beneficial. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Um, and I think this is the challenge that, you know, that when we have to recognize that the role of the role of artificial intelligence yeah. in social connections, in social networking, you have to be very careful about, yes. um, if, if you're getting the majority of your news oh. from social media, you're probably in trouble. Yeah. Um, yeah. you you're definitely in trouble. <laughs> yeah. And well, I, you listen, I, I, I have social feeds that I pay attention to, but I know where they come from and I'm not right. concerned about, I'm not concerned of, of nefarious, right. Uh, uh whether it's political right. or, or, or corporate, I'm, I, I pay attention to those feeds. Sure. I'm, I'm a, I'm a judicious consumer. Yeah. I got it. As, as I am with my written material as well. I mean, right. You know, you know, or, or a movie, you know, man, have you seen Boys in the Boat yet? No, I haven't, but I actually heard about it. The book, first of all, the book is ridiculously good. Okay. Re I mean, I read the book in 15 when it came out, yeah. when we were out in Washington, we went and saw, you know, it was, it was, we were in Washington, we were in Seattle and we went and saw the movie release out there. The movie's great. Okay. Oh. The book is 10 times better. Um, but, but I'm, I'm going back to authentic what, what is is the information that we're getting is it authentic or is it curated is it manipulated um so and i and again i'm not a, i'm not a huge conspiracy theorist i i tend not to go down those those rabbit holes but i'm also a very judicious consumer of information uh and i always take a step back and say wait a minute does that make sense i mean yeah. let's follow this back i mean you know, people throw things out politically one side or the other. And I, and I'm like, wait, stop for a minute. Think about what you just said. Think yeah. about all the things that have had to happen for that, to, for that. And I'm like, do you really think all those things happened? And when you stop and think, it makes a difference. The, the, you, that you just said it best. You're a judicious consumer of information. So you're an educated, intelligent, critical thinking consumer of information. The average person isn't. And unfortunately, that's the problem was what you just said is that the media is so manipulated. It, but but we all can fall prey to this. You know, like I, I know my wife sent me a link like three nights ago or two nights ago, you know, because the, the, there was an, or a, a, a tornado that went through Panama City right, happened on Tuesday. Day. And she sent me something off of Instagram, you know, to Instagram, which I, I mean, dude, like at the level that I create every day, I'm barely on social media. My, you know, people say, oh, you're on there. I'm like, no, those are my teens. But the, yeah. but the reality is, is that when I do go on, it's like, if my wife sends me something or my daughter, 
And so I click on this link and it's like this fear porn, uh, easily modified, you know, photoshopped tornado on the beach in uh, quote unquote uh, Panama City. And I had already seen the real footage and I literally sent this back to my wife and I'm like, what is the matter with you? This is fake, right? But so yeah. the point is, is it, to get back to what you were saying is that like a lot of it is curated and edited and modulated and basically fake. And, and, and if you're not really, you know, guarding your time and like you said, judicious consumer, <laughs> you're going to be misled and deluded and dude, it happens to the best of everybody. Absolutely. And it, they, they've learned to tap into your fear circuits, which are which are legitimate circuits. Um, and, and, and you have to recognize that, you know, l- l- we're going full circle right now because, you know, we're, we're here to talk about HRV plus and HRV yeah. things like that, which yeah. is a measurement, which is a measurement of fear. Exactly. This is one of the things that go into that. That's and that's why it's such an important thing to pay attention to. Yeah, dude, that's a great point. So we'll transition, but I did, it's funny you say that because getting back to literally what you just said about the point about how they track us. Like, you know, when you, when you shop, right. And you're shopping online for whatever it is you shop. And then all of a sudden you go on your first social, there's the ads, yeah. right. And you're like, wait a minute. Like, how do they know? That started happening five or six years ago. But again, how many people you and I, cause this is our life, but like how many people truly are even aware that that's influencing their decision. Now I got to tell you, that doesn't bother me because I'd rather get ads for things I want rather than tampons. Of course, okay. of course. But, um, you know, so you know, so there there is some value there, um, but I I I'm I'm with you on that. You have to recognize that it's going on. All right, so uh, so getting into so great great segues, but uh, talking point number one is well, how did you get interested in heart rate variability? You know, okay, so it was interesting. So I, I'm I've been trained as an exercise physiologist for I I finished up my graduate work in '86. Um, I was a adjunct university professor by '89, and I've been you know I've been teaching the exercise sciences for for that long. Yeah. Um, now along the way, I had the opportunity to go work for Polar, the heart rate monitor company. Sure. Sure. Um, so I've always had a foot in academics, but I've always, uh, I've always kept another foot in high performance and or tech. I love, I love tech. Um, so working for Polar and, and one of the challenges, and you know, this Jay, when you, when you're doing exercise prescription, intensity is important. And back when we were teaching this, we were teaching 220 minus your age, calculate 85%, <laughs> yada, yada, yada. Um, that's, that's what we were teaching. In fact, we were teaching people to measure your heart rate by taking two fingers and put them on your carotid. And all of a sudden, I've got this device that I put a strap on and I have 90% accuracy. But not only do I have what my heart rate is now, I wind up with a with a representation of the entire workout. I've got these buckets of intensity that I can go back and evaluate. Was this a good workout or not? Yeah. And how do I modify? And so, so, and this is consumer technology. You know, these yeah. are these are devices that you're buying for less than four hundred dollars, three hundred dollar range for the good ones. Right. Well, now that is all in your phone. Yeah. You know the the bad of the bad of the phone. We've talked about the good of the phone is that that's a, that's a computer in your pocket that can be amazing. So, and while I was working for Polar, I see they have these features that they're launching. It was called Own Zone, Own Index, Own Something. And these were based on this concept of heart rate variability. And, and I had still, I had never heard this term. I'm, you know, I have a master's degree. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm legitimately writing curriculum, reading, doing these things all the time. And I've never heard of this term. So I start to dig into this. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. And again, Polar's a Finnish company. HRV is very much a Russian uh, variable. The Russians really figured this out in the in the early 60s with their with their cosmonaut program. Yeah. And the and the Finns took it and in and put it in technology. Yep. Um, so I'm all of a sudden to do exercise prescription. I'm not locked into 220 minus your age times 85 and 70. I'm now able to look at, they had the ability to look at exercise intensity from the bottom up. They had this little test that you did. You sat for a minute, you stood for a minute, you walked for a minute, you ran for a minute. And it was looking at the change in HRV with each of those stages. 
it gave you the bottom of the zone where we were calculating the top. It was giving me the bottom and the bottoms where the values at knowing that point is huge. You go on for a few more years. You learn about lactate testing. You look at lactate and its impact in that shift between zones three and four of a five zone system. Yep. And it's like, okay, this is so, so tech is what's driving this HRV thing, the, the availability of good consumer tech. Well, you, we go on a few more years, and, and Jay, I had a lab that I people would come to me. I would do testing. I would do this work. And I got to the point, I had a, actually, I had a police officer. I had a 9 o'clock appointment with, with a police officer to do testing. He comes in, and I just got to where I was collecting resting HRVs before I tested everybody. And um, why I was doing that, I'm not exactly sure. I just knew it was going to become valuable at some point. And this guy comes in and is is resting um, RMSSD or is this classic HRV score that most people are using, is in the is below twenty. Yeah, and I'm usually not comfortable doing a test on someone unless it's thirty five or above. Didn't know why at the time, but uh, that's just where my that's where the science met the art, right? Sure. Um, so I said to him, I said, I said what what I said what did you do yesterday? I said tell me about how you slept last night. And he looks at me, he goes, how do you know that? And I said, well, just tell me. He says, well, I didn't sleep last night. I just got off work. I worked midnights and I came over here. And I'm like, okay. I said, I'm glad I know. And again, when you're, when you're working in a lab, you don't know what this person's been through the last hour, day, week, month. You don't know what they're bringing in. You just have right. this person sitting in front of you. Right. And if you think you can take anyone and throw them on a piece of testing equipment, not knowing background, you're kidding yourself. You're, you're, you, again, you're that formulaic person. You're not the person who really dives into this. Yeah. So, so that was the first time I'm like, okay, this is, and this guy, listen, his fitness test, his employment depended on his fitness test. Sure. And I said, we shouldn't do this test. You should, you should go home, come back, get a good night's sleep. And let me, when he came back, his resting age RMSSD was in the mid sixties. So we went from below 20 to the mid sixties. Yeah, the test I, I was able to get was valid at that point. Yeah. Okay. So we then move along. So the HRV measuring HRV was something that I that just became part of what I did. I had a little facility in that little town that I that I grew up in and that I lived in, Granville. And um the the wrestling coach from Ohio State, I'm I'm an Ohio State wrestling alum. I was on the team 80 through 85, and the current coach had come over. Um, he wanted to do exercise testing. He was riding bikes and wanted to get better. And I came over, I did the whole routine and he loved it. You know, I mean, he really bought into it. Well, two years after that, he calls me, he says, I've got an athlete that's struggling that I want you to test. And I said, well, I said, I can't, I can't do that for free. We've got to do this. And he's like, no problem. Bring him in. Um, so this kid comes over and this kid's a very talented wrestler. And this was 2015. So. And to put the, and to put it in perspective, Ohio State at the time had a wrestler who had won three national titles and was coming back to win his fourth. And, and to date, there's only ever been five guys that have done that. So at the time, there had only been three before that. Um, but um, and we had these three freshmen that were very talented. One had gone went on to win an, an Olympic gold medal. All three of them were national champions. Um, all three of them were four-time All-Americans. Um, so we had them as freshmen. We had this. We had uh, Logan who was coming back. But you, to win a national title in wrestling, you really need five, six, or seven point scores. You got to score eighty to ninety points back then, and you need four or five guys to do that. Well, one of his wrestlers was this very talented wrestler from Pennsylvania, a uh, two or three-time state champ in Pennsylvania, which is really hard to do. And this kid was just underperforming. Coach brings him over. I wire him up. His resting RMSSD, first thing on a Sunday morning after having not wrestled since Friday night, was 15 milliseconds. Wow. Um, which is roughly equivalent to the score that if, if we're sitting in a room and a bear walks through the door, that's what our RMSSD drops to. That, that's full stress. Right. So I have this kid go lay down while he's laying down in my facility. His HRB climbs up to about a hundred milliseconds. 
takes about five minutes to do it. And then when he stands up, as soon as he stands up, it drops back down to 10. Wow. And I'm like, hmm, just the act of standing for this kid, the body recognizes as a stress state. So I go ahead and finish the, finish the, the testing and his, his capacity was half of what it should be. The, I mean, he was classic overtrained athlete. And I said to the coach, I said, listen, I said, I, I used the term overtraining back then. I don't use that term anymore. And we can talk about that. But I said, you, he's, I said, this kid is maladapting to your training. He's not adapting. He's maladapting. And he said, what do we do? I said, you have to train him for what he's ready for. How do you do that? I said, we need to measure his HRV every morning. And then we will go ahead and design his training. So literally for close to three weeks, we would measure in the morning and I, I never released him to wrestle live for two weeks. Okay. Cause he just did not have the ability to do it without creating a huge stress response. Yeah. So we finally backed this down and I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll send you a, a video that I did on this that you can put in the show notes. It's on YouTube. Sure. Um, so literally as we started to, to titrate his work, you saw HRV improve. We got him into big tens. We got through big tens, but the big deal was he finished eighth in the big 10. And, and if you know anything about wrestling, big tens is where wrestling is at. Um, and we got him through, he finished eighth, qualified for nationals, but he had to score 12 points twice in order to get through that tournament, which for him, he was winning matches two to one, three to two, stuff like that. He was not scoring points. Um, we, so he scored and I'm thinking, okay, we're making progress here between nationals and big tens. We continue, I flow in some other product, but I was able to send this kid to nationals with a resting RMSSD of 75 milliseconds. Well, he winds up being fifth in the country. Um, point score for the team and the team wins the national title. Now, let me put this in perspective. When I first went into that wrestling room, when the coach brought me into that room, I knew the coaches, they knew who I was, but they didn't know what I knew. Um, they knew how to train guys for national. They knew how to train guys hard. They were good with a whip. And when I would step in and say, no, this guy's not wrestling live, he's drilling. And I did that day after day after day. They thought I'd lost my mind. Um, you can, you can't, you can't go to nationals just drilling, you know, right. it just doesn't happen. And, but you also can't train this kid the way he had been trained. Um, so he makes all American and all of a sudden the coaches look at me and are like, okay, what is this voodoo that you have? Yeah. Um, and and this started the process. So they bring me on staff as a sports scientist, and we start a program of measuring HRV. Uh, one of my alumnus and a former teammate uh, bought me a first beat system, and we start doing 24 and 48 hour studies on the entire team. Um, but I can only do one guy at a time. But we learned a lot, and we moved the needle. We continued to improve. Um, but then the year after that, the U.S. Air Force uh, Research, uh, the, the um, I'll think about the name, the Air Force Research Lab, where all the elite warrior data is done. This is where they look at Navy SEALs and Army Delta Force and all these elite warriors. They had come to Ohio State to work with their athletic department in using wearable technology to help predict uh, athlete performance. And they'd been working with football and they heard about my program. So I went from where I could wear, measure one guy a day and they say, what do you need? I said, I need, I need capacity. Well, they hand me uh, 16 Omega wave systems. Um, so I go from where I'm one guy a day to where I'm measuring 16 guys a day. Um, our data continues to climb. And Jay, by the time I finished in 18, we went to nationals. So we qualified 10 guys for nationals. In the 18 season, first time in wow. school history that we qualified the whole starting lineup. We had eight All Americans, the most in school history. The two guys that did not make All American, I predicted the first day of the tournament. Now, I did everything I could to get these kids ready. I got eight of them there. Two of them we didn't get there, but I got to where if you it, listen, if your HRV, if you're a college wrestler and your HRV is not greater than 70 milliseconds, you will not make All American. My Olympic gold medalist had 125 milliseconds. My national champion, well, I had an Olympic uh, bronze medalist was 100 milliseconds. 
my national champion who did not have Olympic experience, 96 milliseconds. Literally, it was a linear relationship between HRV and performance. So we learned. What we learned is that we can train hard. We, we, there's a lot of people that can train you hard. Okay. The question is, are you putting the, the time in that that training yields recovery and growth and super compensation? And, and again, going back to my, the, 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 the Kenny, the kid I was telling you about first that we first started working with, one of the first things I had to do with him was teach him why it's important to sleep in a bed by himself. Now, his girlfriend was bent out of shape, okay? And I said, Kenny, I'm not saying don't have relations with your girlfriend. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying finish your business up and either you go get back in your bed or she goes and gets in her bed, but I want you sleeping by yourself. And I want you to turn your room into a cave. We were driving recovery. Right. Um, girlfriend was happy with me when he made All-American. Um, but, um, you know, and, and people could see it as we went. So this is how I learned about HRV. Now, the next step was kind of ironic. This is how I wound up working down in Florida that while I'm at Ohio state, I've got people contacting me from all over the country, pro pro strength coaches, people like that. And they're like, what do you know about THC and HRV? And I said, I don't know anything about it. No. My guys are NCAA athletes. Right. No. And, um, well, finally a good friend of mine that I worked with at a tech company in, in, um, in New Mexico calls me, he goes, do you want to work in cannabis? And I go, yes, I want to understand this. He, so he, so he hires me to be the medical director. Well, the director of applied science for, a a, a, a cannabis company in Florida. So you, I don't know if you've seen the grow healthy stores though. We opened that company. And my job was to go down and build a medical brand in cannabis, which meant I needed to understand cannabis. Yeah. And, and, and Jay, I don't know if you've, if you've crossed this veil, but when you move into the cannabis business, the amount of information that is available is overwhelming. I mean, there is so much good science. Anyone who says cannabis does not have research has not bothered to open their eyes. Yeah. Um, the research is, is, is tremendous. There are volumes and volumes of volumes of great research on cannabis. You've got to understand it's not about THC. Right. Okay. Beginning, end of story. And, and what was funny, I'm, I'm down in Palm beach at the breakers at a medical conference and, and it's a pain, there's Florida pain management conference. And, um, this, this Jamaican medical assistant walks over to me and she says, you know, man, we used to grow this in our backyard. Yeah. And, and I said, and I said, oh, really tell me more about this. She says, my father would take it and he would soak it in our finest rum. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And not just rum, not just junk rum, his finest rum. Right. And he said, when I would have a minstrel cramp, they would give me a shot of this in my orange juice and it would take care of it. And my father would come home and he would rub this on his knees after he worked in the fields and it would relieve his pain. And I thought, okay, there's something I really want to understand this. So right. there's a way to extract terpenes and cannabinoids from cannabis that's called ethanol based extraction. That's what, that's what they were doing with the alcohol. It keeps the acid form of the molecule intact. So, so THC stayed THCA, CBD stayed CBDA. And anyone who is in, who has looked at cannabis has seen this thing called CBD. Yeah. CBD was essentially junk. It was essentially a, a disposal product from the cannabis industry. But along the way, some folks working with epilepsy figured out that CBD helped my kid have less epileptic seizures. So all of a sudden, CBD starts to get some value. Well, you look at this long enough and what you find, it's not the CBD. It's the CBDA. It's the acid form. It's the original form. This hangs on a bunch of different, on a bunch of different receptors. So when you start to dig into cannabis and understand it, you start to see, okay, there is a pain relieving effect. There is an inflammatory relieving effect. The number one thing that drives poor HRV is inflammation. Right. 
That's what drive and and we all know the inflammation issues that we deal with. Um, so so that's that's kind of the long story. And then and then I get one of the guys I worked with down there in Florida calls me one day and says, "What are you doing?" So I'm looking for a project. And he says, "Well, I'm working with this company called Longevity." flagship product that we launched uh back in 20 was a product called spermidine life yeah uh, spermidine is a molecule in the autophagy pathway and that's a whole nother podcast but um i use spermidine yeah and then along the way what was interesting jay was um uh dave asprey featured one of our doctors on his podcast and we blew up okay it, it was one of the best things that happened to us but what we found, so I I would have, when you purchased the product, you got an invitation to have a phone call with me. Um, so I wound up speaking directly to probably 500 of our first 700 customers. And Asprey at the time was an advisor to Aura Ring. Everyone had an Aura Ring. No one knew what the hell to do with it. Um, you know, so we've got this parameter, this HRV parameter out there that people are starting to pay attention to, but no one knew how to manage it. Um, so they came to me and said, can we make a, can we make a supplement? I said, I've already made it. You know, my apartment in, I was in North Palm beach. And when you walked into this little one bedroom apartment, I had my kitchen looked like breaking bat. I, mean, <laughs> I had gram scales and beakers well, and all that. Right. I was, I was figuring this stuff out. Um, and I developed, I developed a, a combination um, and several people were using it and I said, I've already got it. So that's where our product that's called HRV plus came from. It was that experience of understanding that, that drove us into the development of the product. That's awesome. Um, just a couple things, a couple more talking points. Um, I mean, I kind of know the answer to this, but I'm interested in your answer. Um, who shouldn't be concerned with heart rate variability? Listen, here's what we know. My Olympic gold medalists have the highest HRV we've ever measured. The minute before you die, your HRV will be zero. So you have a range. You want to move away from zero as much as you can. Okay. <laughs> um, because as you're moving towards zero, you're moving towards death. Um, and as you move your HRV up, you're recovering better. You have better resilience. You have these. I believe that HRV will become the KPI. I, you know, it's going to take time. The technology has got to get better. Listen, my daughter just graduated from Ohio state with a degree in, um, exercise science in 20, 2020. Yep. They still were not teaching HRV in the exercise phys classes there yet. Okay. And I cannot do exercise prescription and management without having HRV data. It is not do it. You, you do not have valid results if you're not doing that. So, so when you start talking about what is the KPI, KPI that I can associate with improved health span, lifespan that I can associate with improved performance, it's, it's HRV and HRV is more than a single number. When you start to dive into it, it can become a fairly complex concept. Um, I talked to, I, I work with several wearable companies discussing this. You know, Aura did a great job of popularizing the uh, RMSSD and sleep scores and things like that. There are underlying data points that I look for that I can't get from Aura. So when I start working with someone, I usually bring other technology into play. Like, what? um, uh, so I work, so there are two measurements that I live on that's called LFHF, low frequency, high frequency. And so, sure. so, so. Low frequency is your, um, is your sympathetic drive. Yeah. High frequency is your parasympathetic yeah. drive. Yeah. So you want your parasympathetic greater than your sympathetic. Let me put this into perspective. My Olympic gold medalist, Kyle Snyder, he's going up this guy again, coming out of, out of Rio. I mean, he's, he, we're ringing a hundred, 125 milliseconds overnight regularly. We go to, he's wrestling up at the university of Michigan and the guy from Michigan had red shirted the previous year, but he was also a world champion in wrestling, very talented. And this guy cut weight to make 275. Um, Kyle wrestled 90, uh, 97 kilograms, which means he walked around our room at about 230 most days. Um, this guy's cutting weight to 270. So, so 
so I, I do all my morning measurements with the team up in Ann Arbor. I get the lowest HRV score I've ever had with Kyle the entire time. Um, now, my language to my guys was, everything looks good. You're ready to go. Good job. Go get them. Okay. Because I couldn't fix anything day of. You know, by that time, the, the die is pretty much cast. Um, so it's, he loses that duel me. Um, it's the first match he's lost in three years, international NCAA, anything. And I get him back to Columbus and I said, Kyle, tell me about what you were feeling in that match. And again, I asked the stupidest effing question that day. I said, were you, was there fear? Never ask a 20 year old Olympic gold medalist if he's fearful, because the answer will be no. Of course. And, um, and so I thought, okay, stupid question. But then I said, well, let me show you what I saw in your data. And what I saw was an LFHF that was way out of balance where I like to see that number below one. I want the, I want the dividend greater than the, I want the, uh, I want the lower number greater than the, um, the first I'm blanking on what those are. Um, (laughs) but, um, and, and his was 20. Okay. He had huge sympathetic drive. And very poor parasympathetic at the time. Yeah. So he he goes, "What do we do about it?" So I hand him a my, a, a brain um a heart math device, um and heart math is a company that you use. It's a it's a bio it's a biofeedback meditation tool that gamifies meditation. Yeah, and you give this to a twenty year old, and all of a sudden they're gamifying meditation. They go off the edge. He went nuts with it. Um. And all of a sudden his scores, man, just drive. So he wrestled, he wrestled this kid, Adam Kuhn, two more times, big 10 finals, national finals, uh, beat him both times. We never went into any of those matches with an LF grade F LFHF greater than two. Now he still had high sympathetic drive, but we were able to boost parasympathetic with that in order to get this kid in balance, to get him yeah. in. And, and, and so he had the necessary resources. So, you know, that was. Those are the little, those are the little things that you learn that when you work with me, I want to see every one of your exercise workouts, heart rate files. I see the heart rate graph over your shoulder. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I want to see the buckets that you're training in. Okay. You're talking about this, this is the map. Yeah. This is not a heart rate graph. <laughs> yeah, my bad. Um, but, um, but when we look at that, I want to see, I want to see, are you creating cortisol unnecessarily? Okay. Cause cortisol, listen, if you're training and you're leaving puddles of sweat and you're, uh, I'm, you know, listen, I like cry. I have very good friends who crossfit. I have very good friends who spin both, both systems are a thousand ways to keep you at max. Um, which is rarely the best way to train. Right. Um, but I want to, I want to, I want to train the system to go in and out of max down to recovery with using intervals. So I want to see your heart rate data. I want to see if you're just living up there. And again, it's a good, it's not a bad place to live, Jay, because when you're creating cortisol, you're probably also creating dopamine. Yeah. Your body's saying, hey, you're obviously under attack. So yep. we're going to try and make you as happy as you can so you can get away. Um, you know, that's that's the evolutionary aspect of this. But But at the same time, that may not be the best way you know, when we finish working out, we need to go into recovery. Well, if you finish your workout and you grab your phone and you're getting agitated by a text you got from your mate or from work or something like that, and you're not able to separate the sympathetic stimulus, or if when you're driving home on Dale Mabry and someone cuts you off and you you go into rage, you've got to learn that, that all of a sudden, all that work that you just did, you're com- you're continuing to devalue it. Yeah. Um, you're continuing to devalue it. And that's why, listen, I, I, I don't think you train without a heart rate monitor. I don't think you sleep without an HRV monitor of some kind so that you can see that nighttime resting heart rate. You can see that nighttime resting HRV. Um, those are, those are KPIs that I pay close attention to. What do you think of the eight sleep mattress? That's what I, that's what we use. Yeah. Listen, I think, I think there's tons of, there's tons, I think it's on eight sleep or any other manufacturer to be able to demonstrate that their assessment technology is consistent with what you would get from high level assessment. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, Jay, I've never, I've never used an eight sleep, so I don't know, 
I, I do have, um, we do have the inflatable mattresses uh, that, that will give me an HRV score. It's not as good as my good wearable device. Yeah. Um, my good wearable device. And the other problem with it is that there's someone in bed with me. Um, so there's, there's going to be issues there, but, um, but it's on them, but I do absolutely believe in the modality of maintaining a bed temperature that's consistent. And, yeah. but I don't think, but as we talked about before we started recording, you know, a good friend of mine, Molly McLaughlin, um, it has a podcast called sleep is a skill. And we have a lot of conversations about this. Um, I personally, my HRV drops if I'm too cold in bed. Um, so I, my bed is typically pretty warm and snugly to get my best scores. Um, so I think, I think it changes from person to person and you got to develop an awareness of this. Yeah. I'm the, di I'm different. I, 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 my HRV is much better when I'm sleeping cold. I sleep more soundly when it's colder, it doesn't have to be like hibernation cold. Uh, right. But you know, the eight sleep offers both sides and you know, my wife is perimenopausal. Um, and so she, you know, is, will experience like, you know, warmer, you know, not really technically hot flashes, but she definitely right. sleep warmer. Uh, but it's interesting. Uh, just before I let you go, man, just a couple simple things people can do to obviously improve and poor performance. You got to measure it. You can't manage anything that you're not measuring right now. But, but Mark Twain said, no, Einstein said that just because you can't measure it doesn't make it important. Just because you can measure it doesn't make it important. So you got to make sure you're looking at it. But we're seeing the emergence of this. But if you want to improve performance, you go back to those big rocks, okay? Movement, nutritious, nutri nutritionally dense food, quality sleep, light. But those go into what I call the jar of performance, meaning that you need to have an objective. You need to have a goal that you're working towards. I think it's a mistake to wake up every morning, look at your HRV and say, um, oh, this is what I'm going to do today. You need a goal out there on the horizon, and then you track HRV to make sure you're moving towards your goal. Um, but I don't use it as a daily decision maker, number one. Num so I think that's where it starts. Yeah. Um, number two is that you, you get all all of those rocks in the jar, they all contribute to this. Don't get caught up. Listen, if you're not sleeping well, HRV plus is not going to do a great job for you. Okay. But if you use HR, the, one of the nice things about HRV plus is that it's improved the sleep of most of the people that take it. This is what, this is one of the things they talk about is what great sleep they're getting. And again, that endocannabinoid system, part of your nervous system is called the endocannabinoid system. If you don't have the necessary underlying nutrients to support that system, that system's not going to function correctly. That's why we put the CBDA, the beta caryophylline in this. But then we've gone ahead and balanced this, Jay. We, it's carried in an omega-3 fish oil, DHA EPA fish oil, that has what's called SPM, Specialized Pro-Resolving Mediators. These are the final stage of the inflammatory process that clean the cell. And we found a lab in Spain that we could put these SPM. So they're all in that one combination. Um, so the, the second rock, nutrient-dense food, you hack with supplements. This is a supplement. Um, this is a supplement that you can use to help balance that, uh, particularly with the omega-3s and the SPMs. But we, then we throw the, the CBDA and the beta caryophylline in on top of that. Um, but yeah, so going back to your original question, what can people do? Pay attention to the rocks. Are you moving? Are Hack it with exercise. Are you getting nutrient-dense food? Look at all the nutrients. Again, spermidine is a nutrient we didn't know was a nutrient until about 10 years ago, and we're just yeah. starting to really understand it. So it could be something that you don't understand, that we don't know yet that you got to pay attention to. Um, you have to sleep. We've been on the West Coast uh, for a year. Okay. So our body clocks are on Pacific time, yeah. but we're now in the Eastern time zone. And my wife is, she's sleeping until like 10 o'clock and she, she kind of gets upset about it. I go, no, 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 just sleep. Yeah. Okay. Let your body take care of it. It'll adjust. Right. Um, yeah. So pay it. And, and, and this idea that I don't sleep, therefore I'm more effective is bullshit. Um, that's complete. You cannot hack sleep. Anybody who thinks you that cannot, you can hack the sleep environment, you cannot hack sleep. Um, caffeine, does, caffeine does not equal sleep. 
Um, and, um, and then, and then finally light, get light on the skin at the right times of the day, keep the wrong light out. Um, you know, that's, that's part of the challenge that we deal with. Don Moxley, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Let me throw up your uh, site. Uh, so modedmethod.com. And of course, you can also find uh, Don on Facebook and LinkedIn at Don Moxley. So ladies and gentlemen, and all the amazing folks who watch the Jay Campbell podcast, as always, support the people that come on. So go to Don's site, again, modedmethod.com and follow Don on Facebook or LinkedIn. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon.